part of my struggle is that, as you had mentioned earlier, regarding the climate crisis in particular, or the ecological crisis more, more broadly, but it's, um, it may be too late, right? There is that sense that we have definitely crossed certain thresholds. And you're still doing the work. You know, you're still trying to generate this, this massive shift in humanity's role within the story of life on this planet. Um, how do you, I don't even know how to ask how you, like, how do you feel about that? But that's not even a really adequate question because to me, it's like, what I deal with is that I've kind of come into this acceptance that there's going to be a massive die off at the very least. There's going to be a radical decline of human population as well as, as we're seeing radical decline of other populations of other species. Um, and we may be entering into a, a, a hot, a, they call it a hot, uh, what do they call it? Um, hot house. Hot or, house or yeah. I almost said hot state, but you know, into a new normal as it were a new, a new state that, that we, we've had, but only millions of years ago and human beings weren't around at all for that. Um, how do you cope with this? I mean, how do you continue doing the work in the face of this information? Something that's really helped me that is, uh, maybe surprising is that I've, uh, I've struggled with depression for all of my life, including in my childhood. And by dealing with depression, if, if you've ever been depressed, when you're in the mindset of depression, it's not just like you're feeling a little bad and you're going to feel better later. It paints the color of your world. It is the eyes and ears that you have. It's the body that you have. So you can't escape it when you're in it. And uh, so it can be very dismal, the feeling of despair when one is in depression. But uh, something that's really helped me was discovering ways to address my depression when I was younger that enabled me to honor and be responsible for things that I cared about. Because the worst thing about being depressed is when you do that someone that you love. And now on top of your depression, you have all of this shame and guilt because you feel terrible that you harmed this thing that you love. You know, it's like, I said this bad thing to my mom and I really hurt her feelings. I was a total dick. Oh, it's because I was dealing with anger and depression. Doesn't excuse it. Now I feel even worse. You know, so there's this way that, that the despair gets even worse when we, when we violate things that are sacred to us. Because we're aware of that even when we're, when we're depressed. So what I gradually came to realize was that there were ways to preserve the sacred even when I was depressed. And then when I wasn't depressed, I had more skill, skills for uh, serving and supporting the things that were sacred. And so over time, I've just gotten better and better at this because of this you know, accident of my history that I've dealt with this particular kind of mental anguish. And uh, yeah, now as I go about the work today, I, I have, um, I've realized just how profound it is that my wife and I chose to have a child knowing what's happening in the world. You know, there are very um, diverse perspectives to be had about whether people should have children right now. And there's not a simple answer. So I'm not going to say because I have a child that everyone should or shouldn't or that someone that chooses not to is good or bad. You know, it's, there's no simple way to deal with the ethics of this. But after we chose to have a child, knowing what is coming and then feeling the vulnerability of a newborn in our hands – and then raising this child who is not able to do things for themselves uh, now, but also completely powerless to choose whether they want to be alive in 2050. We made that choice, not them. We chose to give birth to them. That uh, it's given me a daily practice of doing two things. One is allowing myself the incredible joy of being with a small child, because small children are just amazing, how inspiring and beautiful and wonderful, how fun they are how nice it is to get to be a kid yourself when you're playing. And that's just a good healing, like break or respite from the, from the work. But the other thing is that um, I now am responsible to something other than myself. So even if I was really depressed and I was like feeling suicidal and I wanted to kill myself, I would think about the consequences for my child and that would stop me. 
And that would make me do the hard work of serving what is sacred to me because I cannot violate it. Like I won't allow myself to. And I think that this is something that uh, maybe is a tough pill to swallow. You know, it's like medicine. It doesn't taste good. But, uh, but we need to take this medicine seriously, that only when we suffer in our own pain and hold to what is sacred to us and honor it and do the hard work, even when we don't want to, it's the only way that some of this is going to be done. And so I might be feeling pretty inspired at the moment because things are going well. You know, they're going well this week. But that doesn't mean they'll be going well in six months. They may not be going well tomorrow. You know, it's just very difficult to predict. But this ability to continue doing the work in service to the sacred, regardless of how we feel, is the key. It's a meditation. It's a lifetime practice. Honor the sacred even when you don't feel like you can. Sometimes you honor the sacred by just leaving it alone and taking care of yourself. Other times you honor the sacred by actively doing something that really causes you pain because to not do it would lead to something worse. And so you see, like, I'm not going to give a rosy picture of how easy it is to be inspired because one of the most important parts of this work is discernment the ability to see the world as honestly and truthfully as possible with all the limits of the human mind, all the tendencies towards self-serving bias, we have to overcome them and see the world honestly and painfully as it really is, but also how beautiful and inspiring it is. So it's not all bad. It's just that we have to take the good with the bad, and that requires a lot of work. Yes. Thank you. Yeah, that really, uh, that resonates with me quite a bit. Um, that's something I've struggled with and, you know, um, there's a, you know, the thing about social media, it's great, you know, connect with people. It's how we connected. Um, but you know, coming into contact with people that are coming into this awareness of what's happening, they're finding each other using social media. Oftentimes what I see is a, a resignation right? Uh, it's, you know, it's too late. And I'm like, it might be, it, it probably is. I am not going to deny the science on this, but like you said, you know, what is sacred to you and what is worth defending and protecting and holding up and in continuing to do the work in spite of this. Um, I, I, uh, I think a lot about this and, um, I thank you for your perspective on that. Yeah, another thing I would just say to kind of wrap it up, wrap, to wrap up that part of it is that uh, the the only way that we um, behave like adults in a time like this, instead of behaving like adolescents, which is what consumer marketing tells us to do, to be good consumers is to you know perpetually be selfish and pursue your own interests, pursue your own needs. But to put your own needs aside and help something else is to be an adult. And so in that sense, um, when we ask ourselves what is sacred, then we are asking ourselves, what must I do regardless of the outcome? Which is, I may fail miserably. This may not work at all, but is it something I still have to do? And when I think about safeguarding the future for my child who is now alive, I, as a parent, have to do that or else I've dishonored myself as a parent. I've dishonored my child. I've disgraced myself. And this is something that in the modern Western world we've really lost, which is the the importance of the positive version of honor, the importance of uh, really taking our own conscience and our own character seriously, that we may fail ourselves a thousand times and still, still find that There is a time where if we failed one more, it would be a disgrace. And that is the time when we rise above. And there are lots of, I mean, a lot of our great literature and most of our dramas and great literature have these turning points where someone rises above the failures of themselves. This is a key element of of tragic uh, drama. Greek tragedy has this element in its story structure is overcoming the unavoidable weakness So it transcends it. The unavoidable weakness remains, and yet right action is still achieved. 
And right action is achieved because it's serving something larger than ourselves. So our personal failings don't keep us from doing it, but we sacrifice ourselves to do it. And this is a, a spiritual uh, epiphany. It's really a spiritual epiphany to see that we are capable of doing this at any time. And in a time like this with what's happening to the planet, we need more and more people who have this level of seriousness about their actions.